Who is Kaiser Soze? This guy is. He's Kaiser Soze. But uh, we don't talk about him anymore for reasons. And spoilers for the following Scooby-Doo episodes. On a rainy night, the Mystery Machine crashes into an ice cream factory after skidding on a pile of discarded popsicles left in the middle of the road. Sorry, gopsicles. Because apparently, popsicle is a registered trademark. Good luck with that, Unilever. Why don't you call up Kleenex and Velcro and go out for a few beers? While looking for a phone to call for help, a gang is chased by three colorful phantoms determined to run them off the property. Stop me if you've heard this before. While driving through a city neighborhood on a dark and stormy night, the gang stop in front of a building that makes sweets. They find some of the company's products outside, which leads them to investigate. Little do they know a group of criminals have staged a robbery and are hiding out inside the factory, all the while using the company's merchandise to hide their stolen goods in plain sight to smuggle past the police. During the course of the episode, one of the villains disguises himself as a bespeckled older night watchman, another gets dunked in a sugary substance, members of the gang find themselves in an inclined ventilation shaft, and Shaggy and Scooby eat food straight off the ground, are put in danger by a room filling up with food or drink, and at one point Shaggy dresses up as, and is mistaken for, one of the bad guys. All we're missing here is a washed up celebrity forced to endure jokes about their obesity. Okay, I've got the obesity covered, but I'm not a celebrity and have never been talented enough to be considered washed up. Not content with essentially remaking an episode that aired three years earlier, Hanna-Barbera also recycled several character models by making just a few superficial color and design changes. This episode is like opening a refrigerator and grabbing a bunch of disparate leftovers to cobble together a meal. And just like a dinner made up of reheated food from days earlier, the kids will be disappointed here, too. The ghost of the bad humor man is the never-say-never-again of the scooby doo universe. Keep it slow, Shaggy. These streets are really slick. If this downpour keeps up, we'll need a periscope to find our way home. <sighs> what? Setting aside the question of why the hell Shaggy is driving the mystery machine, in the previous shot, Fred is clearly the one driving. Mmm, <laughs> wet dog. Well, I guess we better get busy and change the tire. You mean tires. Shaggy's blown all four. While it is possible for a tire to go flat after a collision, something to do with causing the seal to break around the rim, I can't help but think that an impact strong enough to break the seals on all four tires would have totaled the vehicle. Not to mention everyone riding inside at the time, especially when they habitually avoid wearing seatbelts. You mean 999, 998, 997? Shaggy will just eat anything off the ground, won't he? You know that joke in the first Scooby-Doo film where Scooby accuses Shaggy of drinking out of the toilet? That doesn't seem so far-fetched if you think about it. If you saw the Mama Cass episode or my video discussing the villains who appeared there, you already know the design, but I'll go over it here anyway just to make sure we're all on the same page. Sammy the Shrimp, a notable criminal hijacker, stole an armored car containing $2 million in cash. He chose to lay low in an ice cream factory in which he and his two henchmen would disguise the vehicle they stole as an ice cream truck, so they could drive past any potential police roadblocks. Real-life armored cars can potentially look like ice cream trucks, if you ignore the missing side concessions window. In this situation, however, what we see at the Happy Humor Ice Cream Company appears to be just refrigerated vehicles to transport cold products and not the colorful ones selling ice cream to neighborhood kids. We interrupt this program to bring you a special news bulletin. A Blink's armored car containing $2 million in cash has mysteriously vanished. 
I mentioned the coincidental broadcast trope in an earlier video, but at least in that situation, someone was there to turn on the radio. Who turned it on here? And how loud was the radio that Shaggy and Scooby were able to hear it so clearly from outside the mystery machine with the windows rolled up? Wow! Two million dollars! You know that's over 10 million hamburgers complete with mustard? That would put the price of a hamburger at 20 cents each. Sources vary, but most indicate the price of a McDonald's hamburger in 1976 would have been around 30 cents though the smaller White Castle sliders would have been closer to 20 cents at the time. I guess we know which fast food restaurant Shaggy and Scooby preferred. Incidentally, in today's money, 20 cents would be around $1.10, while 30 cents would be around $1.66. In 2024, the average price for a McDonald's hamburger is around $2.50. This would have made the average burger cost around 45 cents each in 1976. With $2 million, Shaggy and Scooby would have only been able to afford a little under 4.5 million hamburgers. That barely lasts them a month. Let's up, run up, vanilla ice cream. Vanilla ice cream on hamburgers? Scooby, you are a genius! I occasionally ask myself if pregnant women watch moments like this in Scooby Doo and think to themselves, you know, the food Shaggy and Scooby described sounds like it would hit the spot, actually. Hey, you guys hear the news about the disappearing armored car? Yeah, but we have our own wheels to worry about. Shaggy and Scooby would have only barely been able to hear the radio news broadcast from where they were, outside the mystery machine with the windows rolled up. There's no way in hell Fred and the rest would have been able to. Two million dollars is over eleven million dollars in today's money. So even split between three men, this was a profitable scheme. And while in the past I have overlooked a reused plot if the money at stake was high enough, this time around the lack of originality on the part of the writers is too egregious for that. I'm giving this a design score of 1.5 out of 5. As mentioned, the outfits this time are simply reused character models from A Night of Fright is No Delight just recolored to match the ice cream theme of the episode. He said, what phantoms? These ugly technicolor phantoms floating through the air. A brown one, a white one, and a red one. It's funny that Hanna-Barbera went out of their way not to use the word popsicle in the episode, likely due to that word being a real-world trademark, when the word technicolor is, technically, also a trademark brand. Looks like Beer Night will have another participant. Technicolor Phantoms? <laughs> Do you buy that, Scoob? <clears throat> Me neither. What an imagination. Shaggy and Scooby, of all people, should not be so quick to disbelieve someone talking about having seen some ghosts. Unlike the questionable transparency used by Creeps and Crawls, there were no special effects this time around. At one point, the Technicolor Phantoms did appear to float instead of run. However, this was inconsistently shown and never mentioned in the unmasking at the end. At least the green globs in the Mama Cass episode were specifically shown to be flying. Sammy the Shrimp and his crew don't even get credit for making their own phantom disguises, considering Shaggy found a spare suit in a box from a costume rental store. Acme costume rentals? What? Was there no spirit Halloween in a closed Kmart building nearby? Okay, yeah, that doesn't work because the first spirit Halloween didn't open until seven years after this episode aired, and Kmart was also still going strong at the time. But my point still stands that this was just pure laziness on the part of the villains. Although the bad guys did seem to spend more time with their phantom disguises than something much more important than that in terms of hiding from the police. It's Mr. Grizzly. <laughs> Mr. Grizzly? That's Sammy the Shrimp, the cleverest hijacker in the country. If the idea was to drive the armored vehicle out of the city past potential police roadblocks, why didn't Sammy the Shrimp do anything to change his own appearance? The officer at the end immediately identified him, which means he was likely already on the police radar. If nothing else, Sammy should have at least shaved his mustache. Though honestly, he should have done that anyway, because 
there's just something inherently gross about 1970s stashes. I've already spent more time discussing Sammy the Shrimp and his henchmen's disguises than they or the writer spent thinking them up. So I'll end it here by giving them a 1.5 out of 5 throw outfit score. I'm giving them a half point for their costumes being at least a little creepy. While Sammy the Shrimp's design and outfits weren't original, and the Scooby writers seem to have given them little thought, in-universe the hijacker seemed to have given plenty of thought when it came to carrying out his plans. For starters, he appeared to have done the necessary prep work prior to stealing the armored vehicle. From the radio broadcast, we can infer the hijacking had occurred not that long before the mystery machine crashed into the ice cream factory. Yet Sammy the Shrimp and his henchmen had already managed to scare away all the factory workers. This implies they had been haunting the place for any number of days before the heist. Then again, we don't really know how long it's been since the armored vehicle was stolen. I keep using the word hijacked because that's how the policeman at the end described Sammy. Hijacking conjures up images of armed men forcing bank guards to surrender so the bad guys can drive away with their loot, but it's also possible the armored vehicle had been stolen while parked in front of a bank or in a garage somewhere after the money had been loaded. Indeed, the radio broadcast specifically stated the truck had mysteriously vanished. This would give Sammy the Shrimp more time to get away with the stolen vehicle as opposed to a brazen hijacking at gunpoint followed by a police pursuit. In addition, Sammy the Shrimp was also able to get hired as Mr. Grizzly, the night watchman at the ice cream factory, at some point prior to the theft. Though he could have been lying about that. It's conceivable he and his men assumed the Happy Humor Ice Cream Company was empty and they had the run of the place. When the gang arrived, thinking fast, Sammy may have quickly snagged a security uniform from an abandoned locker and pretended to be the watchman to get rid of the new arrivals. He may have also been faking his near deafness to confuse Fred and the rest. I'm Avery Queen. I own this factory. We never once saw any scenes with Grizzly and the factory owner. If we had, Mr. Queen might have immediately recognized the security guard was fake because as far as he was aware, all his employees had left in fear of the Technicolor Phantoms. I smell bacon. Bacon? And what? Bacon and eggs in an ice cream factory? Something's wrong. Why would that be suspicious? Large factories often have cafeterias to feed their employees. Hell, just a few episodes earlier, the gang was treated to food by one at the end of another mystery. The bacon odor is coming from this room, Scoob. Reds and <laughs> Right on, Scoob. Then I'll have them once over lightly. Shaggy and Scooby don't even pause for a moment before stealing someone else's dinner. Bang blasted eyeglasses! Those were smoking hot eggs, likely dripping with grease, and should have burned the hell out of the man's face, especially as they were left to sit there for several moments before being wiped off. Oh, eggs! My eggs! Forgot all about them! Can I blast it? Burned them to a cinder! Eggs and bacon does seem like an odd meal for trespassing criminals to cook for themselves the night of their robbery, but it only emphasized how secure Sammy the Shrimp and his men felt in their hideout. That the food was left unattended while on the stove may indicate how panicked the villains were after they heard the mystery machine crash into the garage doors. Sammy went all out in selling the character of Grizzly, except if he was determined to play the role of a night watchman, why did he leave the teenagers to wander the factory unescorted? Instead of trying to scare them off or even mention the phantoms, he should have kept playing the role of a responsible employee and called a tow truck to take the mystery machine to a mechanic. He could have even called a taxi to take the gang to a hotel. If more Scooby villains acted kindly to strangers, they'd probably get away more often with their schemes. The popsicles, sorry Unilever, gopsicles, left in the middle of the road are also a bit confusing. While they serve the purpose of getting the gang involved in the mystery, why were they there in the first place? The implication is that someone emptied an ice cream truck, perhaps to make room for something else, but the money was still in the back of the armored truck at this point. 
Is it possible a legitimate ice cream truck driver, fleeing the factory in fear from the frightful phantoms, failed to fasten the fixture on the door, thus spilling the frozen product all over the road behind them? All those ice cream trucks in the garage also got me thinking how much more convoluted Sammy the Shrimp's scheme was than it needed to be. Instead of going through the hassle of painting the armored car, why not simply transfer the money to two or three of the real ice cream trucks before parking the stolen vehicle in the back of the garage and covering it with a tarp? The factory was abandoned, so it could take the authorities days or even weeks to find it. Using the ice cream trucks to smuggle the stolen money would have also allowed Sammy the Shrimp and his henchmen to immediately leave the city, whereas their painting scheme required them to wait for hours or possibly even an entire day for the paint to cure enough to be able to safely drive away without it running and exposing the armored car. Hey, maybe it's an earthquake. Something's fishy. An ice cream truck can't be that heavy. It's even fishier that they keep it locked when it's inside their own garage. Their decision to use the armored car for their getaway ended up being one of the pivotal moments in the episode that exposed their scheme, as Fred, Daphne, and Velma's suspicions were raised when they encountered the cracked concrete floor in the factory garage. All this white paint was used recently. It's still wet inside the cans. Yeah, but nothing is painted white in here. Except for those ice cream trucks. Who leaves cans of paint lying around without their lids? This was another fatal mistake made by the villains. If they had simply closed the cans properly, the gang may not have noticed them, and thus wouldn't have given the ice cream trucks in the garage further scrutiny. Bone dry. Sammy the Shrimp missed his calling in life. He should have been a professional sign painter because that is an impressive example of painting freehand without a stencil. Hell, I use painter's tape to mask the edges of a room and still end up with uneven line work. Fresh white paint. Hmm, it sounds like solid steel. What the hell are Fred's knuckles made of that it makes that sound when knocking on solid steel? While impressed, the Scooby Riders finally acknowledged weight in one of their villain schemes, I question whether this should be considered a mistake on the part of Sammy the Shrimp. Should he and his men have known the stolen armored vehicle would have been too heavy to safely park there? To answer this question, we would need to first determine how much weight the factory floor should have been able to support. Oh, sh**. Math. As always, I'm going to be relying on a lot of supposition and estimation here, not to mention my spotty understanding of applying numbers to real-world physics. If any structural engineers or mathematicians happen to be watching, feel free to point out any egregious errors on my part in the comments. Just please be kind, and remember, you're dealing with someone who last had to solve story problems in math class back when Bill Cosby was America's dad, and not America's creepy uncle who went away for a while, but now is back, but some aunts won't let him near their kids at family reunions. Going by industry standards, it's likely the concrete floor of the Happy Humor Ice Cream Company garage was at least 8 inches thick, which is standard for commercial use. This would have provided support of around 160 to 200 pounds per square foot. On average, an armored vehicle typically used by security companies is roughly 18 feet long by 8 feet wide, giving a bottom surface area of 144 square feet. At 160 to 200 pounds per square foot, a section of concrete floor the size of the armored car could conceivably support anywhere from 23,000 to almost 29,000 pounds of weight, or roughly 11 to 14 and a half tons. By itself, the armored vehicle could weigh around 7 tons when empty, but when filled to capacity with gold bars or other heavy precious metals, it could top out at 27 tons, far exceeding the weight capacity of 8-inch concrete. However, we're not dealing with gold, as the radio report specifically stated the stolen $2 million had been in cash. That could still weigh a lot, but not nearly as much as gold. We may not know the denominations of the stolen cash, but since we do know how much was involved, we can at least determine the range of weight in question. $2 million in $1 bills would weigh a little under 2.5 tons, 
while $2 million in $100 bills would weigh a little over 44 pounds. Thus, our armored vehicle here in the episode, still containing the stolen cash, could conceivably weigh anywhere from 7 to 9.5 tons. This is well under the reasonable maximum weight limit of the concrete floor in the factory garage and should not have cracked it. Further, just looking at the size of the vehicle in question, it's clearly a lot smaller than 18 feet by 8 feet and should weigh far less than 9.5 tons, even when filled with cash. Based on what we see in the episode, it still somehow managed to crack the concrete floor, but this cannot be considered a mistake made by Sammy the Shrimp and his henchmen. No, the real villain here was a shoddy building contractor. Was choosing the ice cream factory as a hideout a mistake? I don't think so. In fact, I'd say this location was brilliant, but not necessarily because of the kind of product being made at the location, but rather because of the man running it. That your van that crashed through my door? It wasn't my fault. The street was full of gobsicles. And we skidded out of control. I thought you were burglars. The silent alarm rang in my house when you busted the door. If your company's silent alarm tripped, wouldn't it have made more sense and be safer to call the police to investigate rather than showing up yourself? Doing that could have ended the villain scheme right then and there. After all, when the gang explained to the police that they had smashed into the garage door after skidding on a pile of discarded ice cream, naturally whatever cops were on the scene would start asking some questions. It's lucky for Sammy the Shrimp that Mr. Queen seemed to have a reason for not wanting any investigators in his factory. Huh? Look! You know we've landed right inside Mr. Queen's ice cream storage room! It's so cold in here, my goose pimples have goose pimples. The freezer door did not have an internal safety release to prevent people from getting accidentally locked in. Oh no, the flame started the fire sprinklers. Not only does Mr. Queen not have the silent alarm notify the police of a possible break-in, he also doesn't seem to have the sprinkler system set to notify the local fire department. Setting aside how the workers would get whatever they were mixing out of that vat in the first place, since there doesn't appear to be any pipes or drains, the fact that it's just an open pit on the floor with no safety railings to keep anyone from accidentally falling in is further evidence as to how little the factory was concerned for employee well-being. Just our luck. It's locked from the outside. Uh-oh. Uh-oh is right. We gotta figure a way out of here before we drown! More safety violations. The same laws that govern freezer doors having an internal release mechanism also mandate all interior doors allow for employees to exit without keys or special tools. Granted, OSHA wasn't created until 1971, so it's possible this particular regulation may not have been around yet by 1976. Such a mandate would also not apply to certain areas of a factory, like a manager or owner's private office. But how likely would any exception in the law be made for an inescapable door to secure what must be one of the most accessed sections of the ice cream factory? Phantoms aside, perhaps all of Mr. Queen's employees quit because they didn't want to keep working in a death trap. We better start looking for them. We find out later that Queen had an allegedly innocent reason for faking his leg injury, but why would he be so sloppy as to leave his crutches on the floor like that if he was trying to convince people he needed to wear a cast? Uh-oh, Mr. Queen is gone. Without his crutches. Who picked up the crutches and leaned him on the chair? That's my own money. With those phantoms on the loose, I was afraid to leave it in my safe. Even if that was legitimately his own money, cracking open his cast like that and revealing a pile of cash in the same room as a mountain of stolen currency right in front of a police officer was very stupid on the part of Mr. Queen. 
there's no way a proper investigator wouldn't insist on impounding all that money to make sure it didn't come from the armored vehicle. In fact, I think there's a very good possibility the money hidden in the cast was from the armored vehicle. Think about it. Sammy the Shrimp and his henchmen had full access to the Happy Humor Ice Cream Company. Despite all his workers having run off, you'd think if Mr. Queen was above board, he'd have at least hired a legitimate security company to keep an eye on the place. With all the safety violations we saw in the episode, Mr. Queen is obviously not above board. So I feel there's a good likelihood he was bribed by Sammy the Shrimp to look the other way. And the whole phantom scheme was just a cover to give Mr. Queen plausible deniability. It's also just as likely Mr. Queen simply didn't want government officials in his factory who might notice his lax safety protocols and fine him or shut down production. Either way, Mr. Queen may have been the real villain in the episode. We'll try to help, Mr. Queen. As soon as Freddy comes back with Shaggy and Scooby... Now own up! Confess! We'll try to help, Mr. Queen. As soon as Freddy comes back with Shaggy and Scooby... Now own up! Confess! Didn't you... Didn't you used to have that on the other side? What? Your, uh... Oh, never mind. Sammy the Shrimp and his henchmen did try to kill the gang at various points in the episode, with one attempt being blatant and the other merely implied. Imagine, Scoop, you and me alone with a million gopsicles! Phantoms haunting his factory and a broken leg are the least of Mr. Queen's problems, with Shaggy and Scooby locked in a room with his inventory. Those two are like Tribbles in a silo of Quadro Triticale. No! These gopsicles, they're like rocks, right? I'll rub them together. See? How about that, Scoob? A nice warm fire! Rubbing two objects together to create a fire only works because of friction. No matter how frozen those popsicles, sorry, Unilever, gobsicles are, they'd have only melted. If anything, Shaggy should have been rubbing the gobsicle sticks together. Faster, girls! He's gaining on us! Let's hide in here! How in the hell did the freezer door get opened? Also, they were chased in there by the Strawberry Phantom. If he had just closed the door behind Fred, Daphne, and Velma, that would have solved everything. Even if the witnesses don't freeze to death, that'd still give the bad guys more than enough time to get away. Yikes! How do you stop this thing? Again with Shaggy and heavy equipment he can't control. If we don't get out of here pretty soon, I'm going to turn into a gobsicle. Hey, someone's at the door. The door's open. Okay, technically it wasn't, because this was yet another animation mistake. It's clear that the sound we heard was supposed to have been the door sliding open by Shaggy, but the animators forgot to include it. The Shaggy Phantom. Shaggy Phantom? What are you doing in that silly costume? Trying to keep from freezing. I thought it was a coat. And now the door looks closed again. Regardless, this was another opportunity missed by the villains to lock the gang up with all of them conveniently in the freezer like that. Nobody builds an ice cream truck out of solid steel. What was that? It's the Phantoms! Oh no, they've locked us in! <laughs> up to this point, the Phantoms had been trying to scare the gang away. Now that they locked Fred, Daphne, and Velma in the same room with them, this was likely the point in the episode when Sammy the Shrimp decided the kids saw too much and now had to be silenced permanently. I give that valve a half turn, Scoob. Mm. Mm. Come on, Scoob, put some muscle into it. Stealing company product is bad enough, but how badly contaminated are all these machines going to be by the time the gang wrap things up? Shaggy's bad enough, but Scooby is a dog. And as any dog owner can tell you, they're not exactly the most sanitary of pets, especially when it comes to shedding. When future customers file a class action lawsuit against the Happy Humor Ice Cream Company because of all the dog hair they're finding in their copsicles, 
Mr. Queen will have no one to blame but himself for having allowed the gang to stay. If the mystery machine was able to make the garage doors buckle by slamming into them while braking, that heavy steel-framed armored car traveling at speed should have easily smashed right through. Nice work, gang! We trapped him! Who closed the armored car's rear doors? A stolen armored car? Here? That's right, Mr. Queen. They painted it to look like one of your happy humor trucks. It was a perfect way to camouflage the stolen vehicle. This is the third time Velma got paint on her hands. What is she wiping them off with? I'm giving Sammy the Shrimp a 4 out of 5 for his operation score. He chose a good location, regardless of whether or not he bribed the owner, made few significant mistakes, and showed determination when it came to dealing with meddling kids. This leaves the Technicolor Phantoms with a final new score of 2.3 out of 5. You said it, Scoob? <laughs> Just steal more product in front of the company's owner, you guys! I would like to take a moment to thank my new Patreon members and apologize in advance if I mispronounce any names. Wolf of Eschenbach. Thank you, Wolf of Eschenbach. Daniel Humble. Thank you, Daniel Humble. Thank you to everyone helping support my channel. It absolutely means the world to me. If you'd like to help, there's a link to my Patreon page below, but please only join if you're comfortable doing so. New members get a personal thank you in the next regular video I upload after they join, as well as credits in each regular video for as long as they remain a paid member. The gang are disappointed that their visit to Washington, D.C. is in danger of being ruined by the rain. Deciding to stay dry by staying indoors, they visit the Splitsonian Museum, an obvious analog of the real-world Smithsonian. They find the institution practically deserted and are informed by a grumpy security guard that all the other visitors have been frightened away by the spirits of three traitors from the American Revolutionary War. City engineer Mr. Willett, museum security guard Mr. Clive, and an unnamed third man devised a plot straight out of Sherlock Holmes to steal freshly printed $100 bills. Presumably while working his day job, Willett had discovered an unused drainage tunnel just happened to run from the split Sony Museum to a currency printing room at the U.S. Mint. As Daphne was the only clueless redhead around, the thieves instead used a loud steam engine in the museum to cover up the sounds of their drilling through the thick concrete wall that separated them from the money. They also decided to dress as the ghosts of Benedict Arnold, William DeMont, and Major John Andre to scare museum guests away to prevent anyone from discovering their operation. To remain in the museum after closing, Willett and the rest hid in plain sight by taking the place of wax figures of the historical traders on display. This allowed them to secretly work throughout the night after the other guards made the rounds. The title of this episode, The Spirits of 76, as well as the Washington, D.C. setting and choice of ghosts from the American Revolutionary War was a product of what was going on at the time this episode was produced. Just our luck. We come all the way to Washington for the Bicentennial Celebration, and all we see is rain, rain, rain! 1976 was the Bicentennial Celebration of the founding of the United States, and the whole year was practically treated like the 4th of July holiday, with the Spirit of 76 being a popular slogan. I was only four at the time and had no idea what any of it meant, just that there seemed to be a lot more American flags displayed throughout the year than usual. I always felt that 1976 was the wrong year to celebrate something like this. That year was chosen because 1776 saw the signing of the Declaration of Independence. For my non-American viewers who may be unfamiliar with the document, it was essentially just a written statement the British colonies over here sent back to England stating our intention to break off and form a separate country. 
While many consider this the birth of the United States, the Declaration of Independence doesn't exactly have any legal weight, and it wasn't until the creation and ratification of the U.S. Constitution well over a decade later that this country was technically created. The fact that it took three years for the original 13 colonies to ratify it is probably why so many prefer to focus on 1776, as it's simply more concise. I just find it annoying how so many people conflate the two documents and try to use the one that has no legal standing when arguing about the actual laws we have. Whee, what a shocking development! Yeah, a shocking development! <laughs> hoping we get to visit the Lincoln Memorial today. As I've said before, I don't want to turn these analysis videos into a collection of animation and continuity errors, but wow. Sometimes they're just so egregious I can't help myself. It's bad enough the Mystery Machine is somehow able to suddenly comfortably seat five passengers in the front, but for the scene to immediately cut from Shaggy and Scooby to Velma and Daphne sitting in literally the exact same spot, is absurd. The villain's plot is a bog standard one for the Scooby Doo universe. Bad guys discover something valuable while working their day job and adopt disguises to scare away people so they can steal what they found. Mr. Willett confessed to us that he stumbled on the old plans of the abandoned storm drain and devised the scheme to strip good old Uncle Sam of a couple million of his freshly printed greenbacks. This is a valuable scheme, and though Velma casually claimed it was worth a couple of million dollars, coincidentally the same as what was stolen by the armored car hijackers in the previous episode, what we see the bad guys actually hauling around is far, far greater than that. Two million dollars in one hundred dollar bills would weigh a little over forty-four pounds and take up around a cubic foot of space, or potentially one of those money bags, of which we see more than a dozen. This would imply that the haul was easily worth over $30 million, or over $160 million in today's money. This plot could also be considered more foolproof than the former, as the money was presumably being stolen before it had a chance to make it to the safety of a vault somewhere. However, this money would also be a lot more dangerous to steal, even setting aside the doubtlessly high number of armed guards one would normally expect to encounter at a secure government location. Any bills taken directly from the mint itself should be easily traced because if anyone was going to keep track of the serial numbers of the missing currency, it would be the people printing the bills in the first place. I didn't bring up the serial number issue in my analysis of last episode's villains because the source of their stolen cash wasn't established. If being transferred between banks, then it's likely the serial numbers of the bills would have been recorded, but from what we saw spill out the back of the armored car, it's obvious they were transporting money from any number of locations, and thus the likelihood of tracing the stolen cash via recorded serial numbers was slim to none. Yes, we do find this whole serial number aspect completely pointless by the end of the episode, but right now I'm focusing on just Willet and Crane's overall design. We'll get into the implementation of it later. Hey, this is serious. I can't find Scooby anywhere. Me neither. I even checked the dinosaur exhibit. You know how he feels about bones. Sure do. You better hope he doesn't end up in the dinosaur room, guys. <laughs> Don't take that! <laughs> oh, what a bump! See what I mean? The Scooby Gang should be legally barred from entering any museum in the country. Also, I know it's a cartoon, but come on. Dinosaur fossils are stone. Scooby may as well have been licking the garage floor of the Happy Humor Ice Cream Company. In fact, the Ice Cream Company factory floor would likely have had more flavor. Hiding in plain sight like this was also something that occurred before in the Jerry Reed episode. But in that situation, the bad guys were considered living wax figures, whereas here, they were ghosts. And while the audience saw them leaving their display, the gang never really considered them living statues. So this wasn't technically plagiarizing an earlier scheme. We've also had villains based on real historical figures before, including those from the American Revolution. But at least this time, the costumes were based on actual bad guys. 
I'm still scratching my head over the Scooby writers having once chosen to use the ghost of Paul Revere. Someone considered a quintessential American hero. Willett and Clive's plot wasn't super original, but it didn't seem to lift any ideas directly from previous episodes. It was also potentially extremely valuable, and considering the U.S. Mint's baffling lack of security, or even employees in what should have been one of their busier production areas, there seemed to be few witnesses that would stumble onto the theft. 3.5 out of 5 for the design. The three spirits of 76 haunting the museum represented a rare moment in the Scooby-Doo universe where the bad guys dress as the ghosts of actual real-life people. Though at least this time, they picked historical figures that most would consider villains when they were alive. When Mr. Siegfried disguised himself as the ghost of the Red Baron, an argument could be made that the World War I flying ace was certainly a hero to his country and was respected enough, even by his enemies, that they treated his remains with respect after his plane was shot down. The next time a real historical figure appeared in an episode of Scooby-Doo was the living mannequin of Davy Crockett, generally considered an American folk hero. This was then followed by the ghost of Paul Revere, one of history's most famous patriots for his contributions to the rebel cause during the American Revolution. So even though the ghosts in this episode may not be the first time that era of U.S. history was represented, at least this time around, with the producers using Benedict Arnold, William DeMont, and John Andre, they at least chose villains. Though even this could still be a matter for some debate. While it's difficult to argue that Arnold and DeMont weren't treasonous men who acted only in their own best interest by selling out their fellow countrymen, Andre was a British officer who was hanged as a spy after having been caught working with Arnold to surrender West Point. Like the Red Baron, he was considered a hero in his own country, and even Alexander Hamilton was against his execution. It's likely the Scooby writers were tasked with coming up with a script that would coincide with the bicentennial celebrations going on at the time, and thus decided to feature villains from that era, but struggled to find any to fit the bill. Choosing unambiguous traitors like Arnold would be the safest, as it's not like the British side had many famous villains from which to choose, or at least any who'd be known to the majority of kids sitting down to watch Saturday morning television. Oh, Shaggy, that's a tableau of traitors of American history, with wax dummies of Benedict Arnold, William DeMond, and Major Andre. I got reasonably good grades in high school, and American history was one of the classes I excelled at. But am I alone in not knowing who any of these guys were apart from Benedict Arnold? In fact, I couldn't even find a drawing of William DeMott anywhere online, nor anything else about him apart from that he was considered the first traitor of the American cause. It's also weird he was depicted in civilian clothes, considering he was an officer in the colonial army when he committed treason. One of the drawbacks of choosing historical figures as a villain disguise is that unless you take some liberties with the design, the ghost isn't going to be that frightening. The artists did their best with the Red Baron and Paul Revere, at least making their faces look monstrous or spooky, but they didn't do that here. The three villains looked just like their historical counterparts, allegedly, meaning they were just three guys in period costumes. That's not scary at all. Granted, the men couldn't be made to look that menacing, as their disguises also had to double as camouflage, allowing them to hide in plain sight as museum display models. If anything, instead of spirits, they should have gone the Davy Crockett route and pretended to be living wax statues. Hell, they could have even brought back Mr. Grisby and claimed he wanted revenge this time around because his ancestors were British and the split Sonian was built on land that had been taken from them after the war. I'll help you kids find him, but you better hurry. It's only a couple of minutes till closing time. Wait a minute. Clive the security guard is the villain dressed up as Benedict Arnold, and he just left the gang. So how can he be here in his Benedict Arnold disguise? There's that friendly guard, Mr. Clive. Hey, the museum's closed. What are you kids doing inside? Wait a minute. They were just chased upstairs by the ghost of Benedict Arnold, who, again, is Clive in disguise. Yet here he was, not in disguise, in front of the gang. 
I've been sleeping in. That is, if you can call it sleep with this mechanical monster waking me every hour. Ugh. Wait a minute. As they're talking to Mr. Willett, they're being watched by the ghost of William DeMont. Except we find out at the end that Willett is the villain dressed as William DeMont. <laughs> the glow coats are coming! They put phosphorescent powder on their clothes and haunted the museum to keep people away. According to Velma, the villains put phosphorescent powder on their disguises to glow but they were also seen as non-glowing wax dummies. There is less continuity in this one episode than the entire Showa era of Godzilla. Nerd! The glowing effect did signify some effort to make the Spirits of 76 at least a little unworldly, though as mentioned, it messes up their ability to hide as the display mannequins. Or at least hide without first having to spend God knows how much time brushing off all the glowing powder my mother used to like to buy my daughter outfits that contained a lot of glitter, and that crap got everywhere. So I can't imagine it was very easy to clean up for the three villains. Ultimately, these outfits left me with the impression of laziness, both on the part of the bad guys who seemed to simply grab what happened to be laying around the museum, and the writers who struggled to find decent real-life villains from the American Revolution other than Benedict Arnold. Willett, Clive, and their henchmen's disguises were mostly original and appropriate for the time and location of the scheme, and despite being lackluster, they did at least attempt a token special effect. But overall, they weren't even close to being scary. 2.5 out of 5. The primary catalyst of Willett and Clive's scheme was the discovery of the abandoned drainage tunnel that led from the Splitsonian to the U.S. Mint. I can't help but think that the engineers who designed the printing press room wouldn't have been aware of the large cavern behind the wall and the serious security flaw it represented, but it happened in the episode, so we must accept it. I mean, it's not like the government hasn't made boneheaded decisions before. Mr. Willett rigged the cotton gin to power the drill. And he zooped up the soundtrack of the locomotive to cover up the cotton gin's noise. Let's start by discussing the three villains' successes. First, they were able to scare tourists away from the museum, despite lacking any real menace in their outfits. Then again, it's not like they were trying to frighten people away from Disneyland. Come on. It was a museum. I'm sure the kids probably didn't put up much of a fight. Used before the invention of the diesel engine to pull transcontinental trains over the Rocky Mountains from Green River, Utah to... Look! This sign says, push button to operate. Oh, sure, Velma. You can be a smug know-it-all, reciting useless facts and figures non-stop, but the moment someone else does, you're impatiently pushing buttons. Hey, have any of you noticed something missing? Like maybe Scooby? Uh-oh. It's nowhere in sight. This is why you use a leash. Worst dog owners ever. Also, there's no way a museum would have allowed Scooby inside in the first place. Just saying. We did it, Scoop! Look at him go! We struck them all up with a triple play! Oh look, more destroyed historical artifacts. You know, I wasn't kidding about banning the Scooby Gang from museums. Second, the villains were able to essentially get the run of the Splitsonian, enough so that Willett was able to use his engineering skills to rig a cotton gin replica to power the drill they needed for their scheme. Further, the use of the train engine to not only mask the sounds of the drilling, as well as providing a cover story to explain Willett's presence in the museum after hours, was reasonably brilliant. Of course, the longer he takes to fix the malfunctioning equipment, the more likely museum executives would decide Willett wasn't competent enough to get the job done and would ask for another engineer to give it a shot, thus adding a ticking clock to the bad guy's agenda. Finally, the three of them were able to successfully break through the thick concrete wall of the U.S. Mint printing press room and bag up millions of dollars of freshly printed currency. This aspect of the crime does raise some questions, however, with the main one being how nobody working for the Mint stumbled onto the crime. That is a huge goddamn hole, and the dialogue in the episode makes it seem the drilling had been taking place over days. I cannot fathom that Mint security guards, not to mention employees working in the printing press room, 
fail to notice this giant cavern opening in the back of the room, literally a few feet from one of the presses. This could have been explained away had the writers established the crime took place over a holiday weekend, which would account for the lack of workers, despite the improbability of them having left freshly printed currency still on the presses. The belts and the footprints both lead to that dead-end wall we saw before. What happened? The whole wall swung around! It was also a stupid mistake for Willett, Clive, and their henchmen to leave wet footprints all over the museum, as we saw them lead the gang directly to the secret tunnel. Secret tunnel! The lower legs of the villain's costumes should have been ruined by the constant exposure to dirty water from the abandoned drainage tunnel making it obvious to anyone that the display dummies weren't as stationary as they should have been. All of this could have been avoided had the three men worn waders or other protection for their lower halves while working in the wet environment. This little delicious piece of paper is equal to 200 juicy hamburgers. <laughs> that would be 50 cents per hamburger, despite the last episode when Shaggy's math would have had hamburgers cost 20 cents each. I guess prices really are higher in Washington, D.C. Worthless! Worthless? These bills haven't had the treasurer's signature, the treasury seal, or the serial numbers printed on them yet. All that money is worth exactly as much as the paper it's printed on. Finally, of course, the fatal flaw in their operation was breaking into the wrong printing room at the U.S. Mint. As mentioned in the episode, the currency they stole was worthless, as none of the bills had been affixed with serial numbers and other important markings. Wait a minute. Bad guys dress up as three American Revolutionary War ghosts to frighten people away so they can steal what they think is a valuable treasure, only to find out at the end that the object of their scheme was worthless. Why does that sound familiar? Had Willett, Clive, or their henchmen even glanced at the money they were stealing, their mistake should have been immediately apparent. They could have either tried breaking into another room at the Mint, preferably one that contained legitimate money, or cut their losses and try their best to cover up their involvement with the drilling operation. This would have been difficult for Willett, at least, considering he was the only one at the museum with the knowledge and access to rig up the drill to the cotton gin. It's always possible the men had realized their mistake, but still decided to steal the unfinished currency in the hopes of selling it to a counterfeiting ring. After all, the paper and the majority of the ink was legitimate, so it's possible a competent criminal organization would be able to make almost foolproof fake currency if all they had to add were serial numbers and a treasurer's signature. Yikes! Double yikes! Oop! I thought they all on fireworks! Did I mention the Scooby Gang shouldn't be allowed within a thousand yards of a museum? From the perspective of a criminal, the failure of this scheme would be heartbreaking, as finding a way to secretly steal money directly from its source, rather than wait until it was transferred to a secure facility like a bank or a private company, seems like the ideal robbery. Of course, as mentioned earlier, even if the villains had been able to steal millions of legitimate dollars, the Mint's recording of the serial numbers would have made it dangerous to steal the currency in any case. It's also worth questioning how the three men would have managed to get the money out of the museum in the first place, what with the time lock on the door that prevents anyone from leaving after closing. If they were trying to abscond with just one of those bags, the three of them might have been able to sneak the contents out hidden in lunchboxes or a briefcase, or even, in the case of Willett the Engineer, an empty toolbox. More than a dozen bags, however, would have appeared suspicious to Mr. Grumper or any of the other legitimate security guards. Worse for the three villains, it had to have been only a matter of time before the hole, tunnel, and missing cash was noticed by employees of the Mint, so their escape window was narrow. As much as I'd like to give the men credit for successfully scaring away tourists and managing to break through the concrete wall and reach the money, the abject failure of their scheme is insurmountable and nothing in the episode offered even a modicum of redemption. One out of five for the operation. Even if they had attempted murder, it wouldn't have been enough to raise their score. This leaves the Spirits of 76, the final villains featured in the first season of the Scooby-Doo show, with a do score of 2.3 out of 5. Though not a terrible way to end the season, it was certainly a mediocre way to do so. 
Maybe uh, good old Uncle Sam might let us keep just one teensy little old bill, huh? <laughs> As sort of a souvenir? Uh-uh. Sorry, son, but it's against the law. So it's against the law to let Shaggy have the worthless paper, but the officer is fine with Scooby eating it? And that's my ranking of the villains from the final set of episodes of the first season of the Scooby-Doo Show, shown here along with the ones from my previous videos. Overall, I enjoyed the experience of rewatching this series, much of which I had forgotten about as it had been decades since I'd last seen them. Though most of the villains were pretty much mid-tier when it comes to the ranking, there were only a couple of real stinkers. My next video will likely return to the Scooby Renaissance before I begin Season 2 of this series. I hope to see you next time. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please like, subscribe, and leave a comment. If you'd like to help support this channel, there's a link to my Patreon below, but please only join if you're comfortable doing so. Patreon members receive credit in my videos for as long as they remain a paid member, as well as a personal shout out in the next regular video produced after they join. The reference to Sherlock Holmes and the cheap shot at Daphne being a clueless redhead is actually kind of clever for those of us who know the original Arthur Conan Doyle stories. Sorry to those of you who don't.